Greetings. Uh, this is being recorded on June 14th. And the topic for today is migration, immigration, asylum, and such matters. But before I start, I would like to alert you to the fact that I've decided to take a summer break for the rest of the summer. And if so this will be the last recording of this COVID series running into the summer. And then come fall, depending on what Ollie decides, we'll either have live class or more recordings in September. But in any event, for the rest of the summer, uh, I'm giving you a rest for me. But before I do so, I also want to say that um, we all owe gratitude to Dean Goethera, who has been recording these and putting them online and doing all the technical aspects to make this possible. And I want to thank him for all the work he's been doing in the last few months. And I hope that we will be back in business in the fall. Okay, let me get to the topic then. The topic is a huge topic and can't be covered in a half an hour, but I just want to lay out some sense of what we're dealing with in the contemporary world. And then perhaps in the fall, we can discuss it in more, in more detail. So historically, of course, you know that we've all supposedly uh, came out of the African continent and migration is as old as time immemorial. Uh, migrations happen for a large variety of reasons, uh, climate, work, uh, uh, desire to go somewhere else, uh, different periods, different, different reasons. But the human species has gotten quite mixed up across the world as a consequence. Um, as centuries progressed, sometimes warfare led people to move as it happens today. Uh, sometimes floods, sometimes uh, other issues of one kind or another. So that eventually by the time, let's say you get to the 17th century, you have a world of people all over the place. Who knows when they came? Sometimes we do know when they came or why they came, but people are quite mixed up across, across the globe. Uh, for example, we read about the Uyghurs in China and so forth, and the Uyghurs are a Turkic people, Turkish speaking people. So how and when did they get there and when did the Chinese empire expanded to include them and so forth. One can go through the history of the world in this way. And the matter, the modern sense of things uh, can in a funny way be dated back to let's say the 17th century when the, so, then the contemporary or modern state system arose. And we've talked about this before, st st the, the name state refers to the legal matters of a territory with a recognized border, with a government that has a capacity to govern and so forth. And presumably the people captured inside the state then have a sense or are asked to have a sense of national, national identity. So as states developed and developed even more so in the 19th century where many of the contemporary states got their borders, uh, and also, of course, empires, that is say the conquest of other people who did not have sovereign independent states. Um, matters having to do with migration became fairly uh, a different matter and became fairly serious. Now, let me quickly say that um, many of your ancestors, if they came two, three generations, four generations ago, came to the United States, and I want to talk about the US for a minute, uh, they just walked in. They arrived by boats and they moved around. They went to settle, God knows, in Wisconsin or New York or any, any other, other, other place. So when did the idea of uh, immigration, that is to say, a government monitoring who comes into the country uh, really start? 
let me sort of say an aside, and that, of course, is that the people, quite aside from the people who came to the United States voluntarily, was slavery. Uh, but then the 13th Amendment was passed after the Civil War in 1865. And uh, so uh, people no longer were being brought in as slaves. But of course, the slaves were considered uh, property originally, right? They weren't considered immig immigration uh, groups of people who were expected to have citizenship, they were considered property until the 13th Amendment was, was passed. So we have a, we in the United States have a fairly checkered history. There were the Native Americans. They're all the people that just drifted into the US when, why? Because of famine somewhere else or unemployment, different groups of people around the world came for different reasons, but they just kind of arrived. So when did the idea of barring people, that is to say at the national boundary, and here again, I'm gonna talk about the US, uh, really get started. Well, the first sort of jump on this came in 1882 when the US Congress passed the Chinese Exclusion Act. That is to say everybody else could continue to sort of come whenever there weren't quotas or anything, but we didn't want any Chinese, right? Uh, so that was, to put it mildly, a racist uh, a kind of closing to the border of a particular group of people. Then matters got more serious after the second, uh, First World War, I'm sorry, in 1921, when the idea was we didn't just want massive of people entering the United States. So there were, in 1921, uh, a quota system was, uh, was put into place, but the quota simply was it limited the number of people coming in. It didn't specify what people other than the Chinese who were excluded. And a little before that, Japanese also started being excluded. Um, and the, there was a, just a random number, 150,000 people a year was all we were will, willing to accommodate. Uh, matters became even more serious in 1924 when uh, a national origin system was put into place. And there uh, you have sort of an, an interesting uh, uh, idea, which is that um, you looked at the US and you said, what proportion of people are of German or Swedish or Italian origin? And then you developed a quota system of so many more Italians, so many more Germans, to some extent based on the people already here, how many were here, and to some extent based on um, just not wanting, let's say, more Italians, so more Russians. So we had a, qu a quota system which was based on national origin of people put into place in 1924. And it might surprise you to learn that that system stayed in place until 1965. And in 1965, um, the quota system went away. That is to say the national origins quota si system went away, but something new came into play, namely, you only 20% of the population uh, from a, could come from a particular country so that you don't, didn't get swamped by Germans or Italians or Russians or anything. So of the people who came into the country, no more than 20% could come from a certain place of origin. If you think about this to a minute, this is really quite crazy because it would mean that, let's say, China and India, only 20% of people coming into the US could be from those countries, but 20% could also come from the island of Fiji, in which case more or less everybody from Fiji could enter the United States. So this system had something fairly crazy attached to it, but it existed until 1965, and then you had no more than 20% of the people, you took away the, the national origins. Um, and by 1965, saying people from X country or Y country shouldn't be able to come became, was viewed as being prejudiced and racist and, and, and all the rest. Uh, it should be added then that um, the numbers of people that could come in continued to be set after, 
after 1965 and to this day continue to be set. Uh, you may recall that President Trump said a very low number, 150,000. That's the Biden administration has raised that back up to almost a million people. So the, the US as well as other countries control the number of people that can come in, but the US no longer deals per se with national origin, but simply says no more than 20% of all the people in the total number that are in can come from a particular country, which as I just pointed out is also fairly nuts. Anyway, uh, so we're talking now about legal immigration. You can't just arrive in the US anymore. You need a visa, you need uh, uh, or to, to come, you need a green card to be allowed to come. Uh, and it's really all quite, quite controlled, right? Other countries have other policies. Uh, and uh, without reviewing them all today, at some future point, we should talk about alternatives but uh, we are so consumed by this issue in the United States right now that uh, it's worth saying a few more things about the US uh, in general. Um, the one group of people that were not considered part of the numbers that were laid out after 65 were refugees. And refugees are, are people who are claiming under international law that for whatever reason, they can't live in their own country anymore and want the status of a refugee and the substatus of a refugee then becomes someone seeking asylum. So where does asy the idea of asylum come from? The idea of, of asylum comes from the post-World War II period when um, it became obvious that just before the Second World War and during the Second World War, there were people that arrived in the United States, for example, Jews from Europe on boats asking to be rescued in and allowed to come to the United States because they were facing death in concentration camps and the rest in Europe. And the US turned some of those boats away. That is to say, there were, uh, it didn't turn them all away eventually, but there were people who lost their lives who were refugees from, um, from Hitler. Uh, who were turned away and then lost their lives, right? So a, a consideration came into being that when people were facing genocide, uh, political asylum was possible uh, and, and or dire threats, you know, somebody was going to be falsely imprisoned for their religion or for their politics. Uh, that one, there was a category, an international legal category called asylum, and you could come into a country, ask for asylum, and the justification of your case would then be examined, as it is today, by judges who would decide that you had justifiable reason to seek asylum. Now, asylum under international asylum law was based on political and religious reasons. That is to say, you could not politically uh, survive, you could not personally survive because of the political situation. Asylum law did not include economic asylum, which is relevant today of simply saying, I'm not able to make a living anymore. I'm starving in my country. That is not under international law as yet, as we speak, a justifiable reason to live. In other words, your life has to be threatened either because of your religion or as a group or increasingly, for example, that you're facing personal violence, domestic abuse, uh, uh, a gang uh, is threatening your family, you're going to be killed. In other words, your life is at stake for political and maybe religious reasons. And the fact that you don't have uh, international law on economic asylum is an interesting fact to face in the contemporary world where so many people because of climate change and other reasons are leaving their own countries because they can't survive as in they're starving. And that is not really covered under international law up until this point. Although in some countries, 
uh, the, uh, the local laws allow people under those circumstances. So the asylum reasons for leaving and admitting people in addition to whatever the immigration quotas are, is a factor post-World War II and is part of what is the conflict now nowadays uh, with um, you know, us, the, the US and, and some other countries. Uh, now, the allowing people in to the country because they're seeking asylum and allowing refugees to come in for one reason or another um, is not just a sort of problem for the US government, or, but it is a worldwide problem. And it has become a worldwide problem for two, re or two or three reasons. First, there are lots of civil conflicts where people are at risk of losing their lives. For example, Syria, for example, Afghanistan, for example, any number of other countries, uh, Myanmar, Burma, and so forth. Uh, so people are uh, fleeing because of their lives being at risk uh, due to either being targeted as individuals or being victim of a, of a conflict. So that is one reason people are leaving and trying to find a country that will allow them to immigrate, uh, either under international refugee and, and asylum law or under regular quotas. The second reason, which increasingly is a major reason in the world, is that people can no longer make a living where they used to live. And that links then the whole immigration issue if in the 21st century, in, and it will do so increasingly in 21st century, to climate change and the fact that land shortages where you can grow things, water shortages for you to survive and grow things are going away at a very rapid pace, right? So a lot of the migration from the Central America, for example, is some, uh, while some of it still has political reasons and so forth, uh, much of it has to do with people who simply can't make a living where they live. Uh, their properties no longer allow them to grow things. They're starving. Uh, they are um, finding water shortages. They're finding temperature shortages so that what they were growing no longer grows. And that is happening throughout the African continent, increasingly in Latin America, certainly in Central America, and also increasingly in various places in Asia. And so the whole global migration issue has become a really, really new, and in some senses, the scale of it is new in the 21st century because it's linked with climate change. So if people would like, if countries or citizens and governments would like people by and large to stay living where they're living, then something needs to be done about climate change. Right. Something also needs to be done about political stability and 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 and, and uh, you know economic injustice and all the rest of it. But climate change is beginning to drive millions of people away from where they are to wanting to go somewhere else. And when they want to go somewhere else, you then have the national boundaries, right, of states who are saying, "Whoa, we don't have to let people in," right. Uh, we are, uh, you know, taking care of our own population, but we can't really add all of these people who are needy, who will need jobs, education, and all the rest of it. So that is something that is confronting almost all the industrial, all the industrial countries, which leads one to believe that the G7 and the G, other Gs and the UN have to address climate change because otherwise this notion of people migrating in the 21st century in order to economically survive uh, can't be fixed and can't even be slowed down, never mind, never mind fixing it. There is a third reason of why uh, international migration is a 21st century issue and will become a more serious issue as the century uh, uh, moves on. And that has to do with industrial countries, aging populations. We've talked about that before. All through Europe, the United States, even China, as it is developing rapidly, have for different reasons, 
a population which is aging very rapidly and not enough young labor moving in. And since in most industrial countries and for policies and reasons in China, although China has just said you can have three children, but Chinese by and large seemingly don't want three children at this point, um, you, 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 know, you can't order people to have children that don't want children. Uh, liberated women increasingly who are professionals maybe don't want children, maybe want one child, but certainly don't want three, four, five, six children to compensate for the people who don't have children. So you have a shrinking youthful population and therefore in the 21st century, a very serious shortage of the of, of work age population in many countries in the world. And it is happening very rapidly so that many countries will be in serious trouble by the time you get to the middle of the century. So migration is not just a question of the two areas that I mentioned of people wanting to leave somewhere, but rather as a magnet, countries will need people to move inside them, right? In order for the country to continue to flourish uh, economically. Now, the one um, interesting uh, country that's somewhat deviant from other industrial countries has been the United States, which has ra a rather younger working age population than let's say Japan or most European countries. And the reason for that is not that Americans are having more children, but rather because of the immigration into the United States from more youthful populations. So when people are anti-immigration, one of the things they need to think about is not what the right wing is arguing that these people all come in and they make a mess of things and they're all on welfare. No such thing. We actually need younger working age and, and soon to be working age population. And we've had more of those coming in than most other countries because we have been a more open multinational society on the whole. Although, as you know, many Americans now are, have become very anti-immigration and it is entirely short-sighted, uh, I, might, I might say. So then, of course, the question arises, what happens to the nation state system? If you start having, you know, you have French and you have German and you have Japanese and you have Americans and all of a sudden all these foreigners, quote unquote, come in. Well, they come in with different languages, different cultures, different religions. Will you cease to be a homogeneous country? No, the answer probably is not. And so the question is, do you segregate people so that they don't meld into the country? Or do you as quickly as possible try to integrate people, allow them to become citizens, educate them and so forth, so that you can become a society that works both economically and, and socially? Now, in the US, we have a slightly different uh, history than for example, Japan, which is monolithic and many European countries until, who, until recently at least, I'll talk about that in a minute, were fairly monolithic. The US has always absorbed its immigrants, right? After one or two generations, we all intermarry, we meld into the United States. And one of the arguments against US immigration uh, from let's say Latin America and Central America is, we hear it even on the streets of Santa Cruz. It used to be when people came to the United States, they became Americans, they spoke English, et cetera, et cetera. But these people, mainly these Spanish people speaking people continue to speak Spanish. And now, you know, they're not integrating, they're just sticking to themselves. Actually, good studies have been made about this. This happens not to be true. Uh, Hispanic immigrants in this next generation uh, meld, learn English and meld into American society as much as any other immigrant groups that has been recorded in American history. So it simply is a prejudice rather than it being true. On the other hand, even a reasonable person can say, well, what, you know, what she just said can't be true because every time I go to Watsonville, everybody's speaking Spanish. What people forget is that new people are constantly arriving 
speaking and therefore speaking Spanish, but that the children of the people who arrived and who are now in high school and college and so forth um, do speak English. Sometimes they're bilingual, especially because English Spanish bilingualism will get you a job. You might have noticed that every doctor's office there are people who speak both Chinese, uh, I'm sorry, Spanish and English. So bilingualism, which used to not be considered very uh, favorably in the United States for actually stupid reasons, because it's good to speak more than one language. Europeans know that because they're small countries and they like to speak to their neighbors. Uh, but bilingualism is getting to be, especially in the, in the West and the Southwest, um, something that many people are capable of doing. But the idea that people don't become Americanized, don't start intermarrying, don't learn English, happens to be a prejudice rather than a documentable uh, true, uh, true situations. Uh, the other thing is that when you allow people into the country, as in legal immigration or legal asylum uh, policies, uh, you have to be able to provide for them, to provide the transitional housing, the health, you have to provide health care, you have to provide uh, work. Uh, Germany has done a fairly good job of that. England has done a fairly good job of it. Uh, but we have done a very poor job because we, have a, we don't have a national health care system. Uh, we don't, the housing is, is in a bad situation in the US. So our social and economic problems, quite aside from immigration, is not ideal to making life easy for people to come in. What has been a virtue of the United States is that people who are on the five-year track to become citizens once they get here, uh, they are, can become citizens while in many countries, including in Germany until maybe a decade or more ago, uh, for example, the Turkish workers that came to Germany after the Second World War, they lived there, their children were born there, but they weren't for, the, for decades allowed to become German citizens. Germany now changed its mind uh, or some decade ago or more ago, so that if you're of Turkish origin, you can become German. If you are of uh, you know, Syrian origin, you can become German. So the integrating people and allowing them to become citizens and voters and full participants in the society is absolutely required. And it's something that a lesson that many countries, including Japan must learn because Japan already has many foreign workers. Uh, and people who've lived there for a long time, whose children are born there without allowing them to become Japanese. And that too, or most of them, a few have become Japanese. Uh, that has to change as the world uh, morphs into a multi-ethnic, multi-racial uh, circumstances. So the idea, the 19th, early 20th century idea of these homogeneous uh, national states uh, is something of, it seems to me, of the past that people need to get used to. And while it is um, uh, politically difficult uh, to have multinational states, there are role models of countries that have done fairly well, namely the immigrant states, for example, the United States, for example, Australia, for example, Canada. Uh, these are states that have over the years integrated their immigrant communities and made them into Canadians and Australians and Americans. And while we've backpedaled a little bit on that, especially people who are prejudiced uh, amongst our politicians and fellow citizens, uh, we ought to look at ourselves and say, we used to do this right. We used to incorporate American uh, people into the United States and allow them to become, uh, become fully fledged citizens having a stake in the country. So what am I saying? What I'm saying is in the 21st century, millions and millions of people will have to leave their country and resettle elsewhere, which is going to be very disruptive to the nation state system as it evolved in the 19th and 20th century. And ways need to be found to encourage countries to be willing to put up with multi nationalism, multiracialism, multi-religious systems, and you know, 
work against the prejudice that makes alien people stay alien rather than incorporating them. And rather than this being considered sort of a charitable thing to the poor people that have to leave here, there, and yonder, we should look at it in terms of our self-interest in the United States as well as industrial countries because people will need to move around in order to have productive labor forces and not just because people are fleeing somewhere. And climate change is absolutely central to slowing this process down so that countries can make adjustments, that people can make adjustments, and so that you don't have conflicts in political domestic conflicts and international conflicts all over the world that are the consequence of large groups of people becoming refugees, becoming asylum seekers and so forth. One final point, and my time is almost up. It is of course the case that countries need to be able to have laws and have orderly movement of people. But having orderly movement of people does not mean that you uh, have the kind of disaster that we now have at the border, but rather have procedures that give people hope that they can emigrate and immigrate into the United States and other countries. And one of the horrible things that has happened in the US is that in the last 10 or 20 years, in order to have a hearing in your case, or in order to have your citizenship applications applied, you sometimes have to wait years and years because our not so wise Congress has kept cutting the funding for the immigration offices in the government, for the immigration judges and all the rest. So we have over a million people backlogged by years who have totally legal claims, but who can't have their paperwork processed. So not only do we have to rethink how many people and how orderly each country can integrate people that A, want to come there and B, the country actually needs down the road, but efficient systems have to be built nationally and internationally so that people are not in disarray, that you don't have you know, DACA children, that you don't have people living uh, in the country, in this United States, even legally, without ever being able to have their particular cases, cases processed. So much work lies ahead. And I would just like to end by saying, in my view, climate change and the movement of people around the world is one of the top two and linked agenda items for this 21st century. Hope to see you all starting September. Thank you.